Hi, Nick here from Pods with Nick and James. Just a quick one before we get into this podcast. I'm going to say a massive thank you for the uh, support that we've received since starting these podcasts. We thoroughly enjoy it and we look forward to creating more. If you want to have your say on any topics that we've discussed or suggest future topics, then you can do so at www.reddit.com slash r slash Nick and James Pods. And if you want to support us, you can do so for uh, from as little as £1 a month. And you can do that at www.patreon.com slash James. Anyway, back to the podcast. Hi, welcome to Pods with Nick and James, uh, a podcast where uh, two friends just discuss different um, yeah, intellectual topics as we um, just have a little bit of a, you know, dip our toes into the ocean of knowledge that we all have uh, at our fingertips um, nowadays. Um, today's topic uh, is going to be uh, one that's kind of always interested me on a number of levels um partly in its ambiguity and partly just in the collect in the way that it's collected together and put into the group uh the topic this week is the renaissance or renaissance if you're american depends um yeah depends how you want to pronounce it if i'm honest with you um my main sources for this topic uh was uh, some of the videos on Crash Course by uh, John Green, um, as well as the Stephen Fry documentary on Johann Gottensberg's creation of the European Printing Press, uh, as well as the Renaissance, a very short introduction by uh, the Oxford uh, University Press by uh, by Jerry uh, Broughton. Um, Nick, uh, I know you've had a number of different sources. Uh, I should have said hello earlier. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the with the intention on this podcast that was was that we would both um, look into the same source. So we were both going to look at a, a brief history or whatever it was called of uh, the Renaissance by Jerry Jerry Broughton, Was it? Yeah, that's how it's. Been. Um, yeah, I, I think that's how it's pronounced. It's yeah, spelled. No worries. Um, but unfortunately, I um, my copy of the audiobook failed halfway through and as such i decided to dip into other sources namely the britannica um quora other other places such as that geeks for geeks um just online encyclopedias and forums things which is where i normally get my resources from but it should give a nice couple of different angles to the discussion no, that's that, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Well, I guess we'll start with the basic thing, Nick. Of um, what what do you believe? Like, because there's lots of different. Once again, because the Rena- the Renaissance was a cultural phenomenon. Um. Do you ha- What are your views on what constitutes as the as the Renaissance? Um. The Renaissance in <clears throat> historical terms was the transition from the Middle Ages to the modern thinking of man. I suppose the best way to really describe the Renaissance is actually to define humanity in the Middle Ages. Okay, all right. No, that's, that's a fair point. So to kind of put it in context... Yeah. So, all right. A human being, a human person, <clears throat> if they like previous to um the Renaissance, they belonged to a church, they were heavily religious and they thought of themselves as that member of that church. <clears throat> and if they were a worker, they would normally belong to a 
branch of work or a guild for example the blacksmith's guild or the woodcutter's guild the banker's guild yeah yeah exactly so it was about ownership i suppose each individual was not an individual they were a part of an ownership um in the middle in the middle ages not to mention the fact that it was very um secular war driven um oppressed violent times <clears throat> um yeah it, it also um one one thing that you you touched upon briefly there is it was about ownership but it was also nationalism yeah was massive like so you're absolutely right the the individual as we understand it it, it seems to suggest almost didn't exist like you were I suppose you could say you? well i'm i'm a catholic well okay yeah. that's fine what what are you i'm an englishman all right fine what are you i'm a woodcutter it's, exactly it's not, and that's that's it's what not... that's what the middle ages was but <clears throat> sorry a bit of a dry throat um that's not what we always were which is kind of what the renaissance was looking at because previous to the middle ages there was there was more of this individuality in greece and in rome yeah. um particularly with people like plato and aristotle um their kind of teachings um it was almost like that was lost in the middle ages with all the war that was going on all of that independent thinking that philosophy was lost and the renaissance was the renewing of it it wasn't like a rebirth it well i suppose it was a rebirth it wasn't the birth of um the modern man it was more like the renewal or the rebirth of um man I'm pretty as sure an individual. you you are you are absolutely correct there. i'm pretty sure that's what the word means um, i should have pulled up yeah Oxford, actually uh, i didn't you know mean what, to make that segue that I didn't mean to know that. No, 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 but that's, right. a, that's a very, very good point. <clears throat> um, because. Do, 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 do. Um, really should have prepared this before. Okay, so yeah, it's seen as a revival or a renewed interest in something. Uh, it also comes under resurrection or reawakening. Um, I find I find that they go a little bit um, they go a little bit farther far in my mind in that they it is the refinding of the self is uh, something that was heavily pointed to in Jeremy uh, Broughton's book. Um, for me, it, although it is the that kind of discovery of humanism, which we'll go into in a, in a moment. Um, for me, it's a movement of, um, okay, so for me, it is financial, technological, cultural, and then ideological in that order for me. Um, but maybe I'm being a bit too... Compartment, maybe I'm compartmentalizing it too much, but for me, that that's kind of like how it seems to have gone. Um, so in my mind, you had the you had the Crusades, and then rather than killing the Ottoman and Turks, um, the Venetian like uh, cities started trading with them, and things over the next couple of hundred years seems to have gotten a lot better. And that, for me, is a a broad, a very broad, mm, a very broad, but also a very reductive kind of history of the Renaissance. Not going into the individual um, amazing accomplishments of people of that time, which um, I'm hoping we'll we'll step into. Um, I guess. All right, you know what? Just some really, ba really basic things. Um, what do you feel was the the most important element or the most okay you know what we'll do element person and then favorite person if that's okay with you mm -hmm. um what was your favorite element of the renaissance um i think my favorite element of the renaissance was the change in the art mm. 
Um, it went from quite broad. Um, it became it, the, the 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 main focal point of most art in um, the Renaissance was on the human form, and it became a lot more um, realistic, shall we say, in the way that they were drawing and very emotive and and there was, I mean, some of the art was so deep in um, like the layers of meaning in the art was it was so clever. Um, previous to that, you didn't really have that level of depth. You had the symbology. Yeah. So, like, you had... It, it was... I, I almost hate to say it, because I, I like Byzantine um, art in and of itself. Um, so, uh, you know what? No, okay, no, the, the art is a good thing, and that, that was... Yeah, that is one of my favourite elements as well. Um, it, just the movement from uh, trad tra traditional, almost ritualistic symbolism to the representation of the real form as it appears in the human eye um, is one of the, I, I think, one of the best things that happened during the Renaissance. And Conversely, is one of the worst things that happened to art after the Renaissance with the Baroque movement, which then started to exaggerate things as a way of trying to overcome that. Um, do you, um, it, it, since since you've said art, what is uh, your favourite example of Renaissance art? I mean. I'm, the joys of being me is that I don't really have, it's only looking into the subject that's really got me into art. Um, yeah, okay. Actually, I, that's a lie. I went through the Vatican City. Um, oh, wow. I, yeah, I, I visited the Vatican City whilst I was in um, Rome. And I think, if I'm honest, the Sistine Chapel uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the story behind oh, it as God, well. Oh, my God, you've seen it. Yeah, the story behind it as well. Did you know that when Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, he couldn't paint. He'd never painted before in his life. He was a mathematician, <laughs> right? This, this is, is the thing that r really annoys me. Like, so, okay, so you know how, like, you look back in time to ancient Greece yeah. and everyone's a natural philosopher? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it they, seems to be there's another term in the Renaissance. They just call everyone a polymath. Yeah. Yeah. And that's which the thing. They did maths and other stuff. Yeah. And to be fair, Michelangelo did everything. Um, yeah. But his, his, I suppose his greatest art was that of the Sistine Chapel. There's no higher praise when you're not even an artist than being asked by the Pope to paint your ceiling. Um, and as I said, like <laughs> he couldn't paint. So. In order to get around the fact that he couldn't paint, do you know how he managed it? Did he copy? No. He, he started, started his painting the furthest point away from where the Pope stood as he could, in hopes that by the time he reached the point where the Pope stood, it'd be all right, and the Pope would never notice. That's amazing. That's, to okay. be fair, that's, ver that's not very, very human. How a man doesn't know how to paint and yet paints the human form so perfectly in the way that he did in that amazing tapestry on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, I have no mm. idea. And he's upside down. Yeah, that... <laughs> yeah he... I heard he did literally lay on scaffolding mm -hmm. whilst, he paint... whilst he painted it. Yep. I mean, there's okay. so much of his Raphael's. There's a lot of Raphael's art in the Vatican as well. Um, a lot of sculptures from around that time, and of course, the dome of the Basilica de San Pietro, mm. the Church of San Pietro. I I really like uh, so Mike out of Michelangelo's. I have to say, his statue of David is my favorite and the my, my reason for that is the fact that he took so with his statue of david 
he's made the head and shoulders um, bigger than they actually are on a human person. So, and the reason why he's done that is to make the form appear perfect from the average standing position. Yeah. So he's taken the form and then he's done an additional perspective trick with the form to make it look even better. You could argue that it's actually the first example of Baroque, and even though I've said that I dislike that movement, this is kind of like the exception almost that proves the rule, that I do like the fact that he was able to do that. Um, the most exa- uh, the, sim- the simplest examples of you get of this sort of thing nowadays is when you get those adverts on football pitches where they've been sprayed to kind of like yeah. work with the perspective so that the people in the opposite stand can see things perfectly. Yeah. Um, it's actually from yeah. the perspective of the cameras for the TV. Oh, right, yeah. They're always painted yep. so that the cameras on the, P- the TV look like they're standing billboards. Mm. But they're not. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, interestingly, did you, did you know, like, I don't know if you've noticed this about um, Renaissance sculptures, but they always sculpted the male package extremely small. Do you know why that was? I imagine it was to make us all feel better about ourselves. It had nothing to do with it. It was seen as a sign right. of intellect. If you had a small penis, it was because you were smarter. You didn't need, you didn't need a big penis if you, were, if you were smart, apparently. Right, I'll try, to, I'll try using that one on the ladies. Uh, <laughs> see, if, see if that works. Um, right, okay, well, <laughs> I did, okay, did not, didn't, although I guess that does kind of fit with a lot of kind of Greek thinking. For example, um, the ancient Greeks thought that the prime of your life wasn't when you were, like, 30 or under. The prime of your life was when you were 60, because you still had enough strength to do most things and the experience to do them well. You weren't governed by your base desires at that stage. You had evolved and were about as smart as you were going to get. There's still hope for me yet. No, well, I am. Okay, well, yeah, that was one of the art of the art of the Renaissance is incredibly fantastic, which is why all of the characters in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are named after those Renaissance masters. Um, Weirdly enough, Splinter, um, before anyone says it turns out, was an architect. I didn't know. He also did lots of other stuff, like a lot of people in the Renaissance. I I do find it interesting that nowadays we've got these very defined specialisms, whereas it seems people in history they invented the specialisms by doing everything absolutely and then doing one thing amazingly well so it kind yeah. of really to me just undermines that yeah because that was a lot of the conversation with the tour guide in the vatican i was like but michelangelo painted like but you're saying he was a he was a mathematician but then he also did architect architecture mm. as well like what was he and she was like well he was michelangelo and I was, I was like, <laughs> okay, fair Sorry. enough, you know. <laughs> but it, 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 he wasn't the only person that was like that. He, he, um, he was one of the greatest like that. But he certainly wasn't one of the. He wasn't the only person that that would paint and sculpt and and do all this other stuff. Um, nowadays, I suppose we are just put into boxes in order to conform in our little place in reality and and mm. that that restricts our ability to to try other things and and endeavor to grow in many different ways and and become a great person not necessarily a good person but a great person given the depth of skill that you might end up with well that that, that does seem to be it um a lot of people, I realise, you know, what people became famous, and they'd always become famous for a reason. Um, so, one of the favourite things, one of my favourite things about the Renaissance, is is that at the time, there wasn't the modern understanding 
of the divide between um, East and West, or like there was there was still both rivalry and conflict between um, Islam and Christianity. But at the times when there were trade, like there wasn't a there wasn't a need to view one history as one history and one history as another. Um, like, so when you talk about the Renaissance, people think that it's something that just happened only in Europe and that it didn't kind of sweep anywhere else. And although a lot of the, the movements, um, like a lot of the intellectual movements were in part, um, kind of Europe and Western Europe, like the, one of the biggest things that kind of started the Renaissance was in fact the victory of the um, Ottoman Turk, uh, sorry, Ottoman Turks um, against Constantinople, therefore dividing um, the dividing church and state, um, which I, I don't know, it's, it, it's one of my favorite it's one of my favorite uh dates in history it's one of my fa- it's one of my favorite kind of um events in history as i don't as although i am uh very religious myself i also don't believe it should be um a dead hierarchical structure you know yeah because if you if you put too much structures on anything then you kill it and that I guess that's one of the thing reasons why I see um, the fall of Constantinople in many ways as as a good thing. Um, my my favorite thing, I guess, my favorite thing um, about the Renaissance is the movement of ideas. Um, the fact that you had so many I knew I, well, you had the you had the people rediscovering the texts of Plato and Aristotle after forgetting about them for several hundred years. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, libraries in Baghdad and the Ottoman Empire in the whole, on the whole for looking after those texts and then selling them back to us. Uh, that's genuinely an amazing thing. Um, again, also the, the dyes used in the paintings um, and in the tapestries and stuff during the Renaissance period, were all bought through um, the Ottoman Empire. Through the Ottoman Empire, and it's just—it's weird that that wasn't ever something I was taught in school. Um, I also find it interesting because uh, going on to when we were talking about um, the Communist Manifesto. The Renaissance for me seems to be the start of modern day capitalism and seems to also be the rise of the bourgeoisie class as a whole. Yeah. But that's a darker age to it. Um, yeah, so sorry, my favourite thing is the, the, the change of ideas. Um, did you, uh, who do you think, I don't know. Okay, who do you think was the most important, um, you know what, I realised I've made a mistake in this podcast. I should have given more of an overview earlier, but that's fine. The whole point of this is the conversation. Um, who do you think contributed the most to the Renaissance? Like, who do you think... Um, yeah, who do you think defines that age the most? I think... Um reading about him, I would probably say Martin Luther. Interesting. Just because awesome. of the work that he did. Um, I mean, he, he dabbled in a bit of everything. Didn't he? But he learned a bit of law and then he learned a bit of, um, like, became a friar, didn't he? And, um, and then he kind of went, I think the church needs to look at things a bit differently. And he wrote the 95 Thesis. Yeah. Um, and, and I think originally he wrote it as a kind of, if I was in power, I would do this. Um, but eventually he hypothetically nailed it to the front of a church um, or an abbey. I can't remember particularly. 
Um, and it is hypothetical. I don't know that there was actually... That, that um, is um, how religious debates and stuff happened in those days. Yeah, yeah. So you just kind yeah. of like forced it into the faces of the church and when this is what you need to be looking at. Um, and then became, by, by proxy, a Protestant. Became the first Protestant, I suppose you could say. Um, and that in turn gave an angle for... Henry VIII, when eventually he moved to Protestation um, away from the Roman Catholic Church in order for him to divorce and uh, he, Catherine, of Aragon. Uh, Catherine of Aragon so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. That was the one. I knew it, it was a, one of those two ways. Interestingly, also, interestingly, something else that I, I picked up on whilst at the beginning of that um, audio book um, mm. the, Brief introduction to Renaissance. It goes on about, um, it talks about Hans Holbein's, um, I can't remember what the painting's called now. The Ambassadors. The Ambassadors. Yeah, I, I, I had to listen to it again to get yeah. that bit down. Yeah, so Hans Holbein's The Ambassadors, which is in the British. It's in the National Gallery. The National and Gallery. I'm going yeah. to go find it. Yeah, yeah. So um, Hans Holbein, he actually painted um, the human form throughout the Renaissance. And he painted the, the the picture of Anne of Cleve that Henry VIII saw that made him want to marry her. Interesting. Isn't Anne of Cleves the one that outlived him? Anne of Cleves or is the one that he married and then immediately divorced because she wasn't as pretty as he thought he was. He, he was. He thought she would be. Ah, but but she did become um one of his. He, like she was, she was still important in court. Absolutely, like, yeah. So, like in, Anne, as a, Anne of Anne Boleyn got killed and got called loads of things. Catherine of Aragon had to kind of disappear in shame. Anne of Cleves is interesting because she had so much political clout that the king, rather than rather than uh, like you know shame her, he just literally renamed her my beloved sister yeah he she became the king's sister um mm. and um he she was given a castle in richmond and a load of land and a load of gold and just, she did actually do very well she, she did really well, well she, she was married to him from january to july i believe of the same year oh my god and then it was annulled as unconsummated um and yeah, but interestingly, as I said, what, there's a really the really famous picture of um, Henry VIII that most mostly comes up when you search for Henry VIII. That was painted by Hans Holbein. Um, and, really? Yeah. Wait, and, the one of him that, where he's a little bit chunky and he's got the hat. Yeah. 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 Oh. That was painted by Hans Holbein. All right. Interesting. Yeah, I know. When I heard well, the, Hans Holbein in in that uh, beginning, I was like, "Wait a minute, that's that guy!" And he did this, and then there's that guy, and he did this, and I was like, "Wait a minute, it's all coming together now." I was like that, like so. Basically, Henry VIII was um, our rena our first Renaissance king. I would, I suppose, you would say um, he brought the Renaissance to the to the to England. That's true. He did. He did bring a lot of things, although humanism. Have been around for quite a while. It's just it took a little while longer to reach England. Yeah, we quite um, like also being some, subservient. Mm, um, and also, just uh, really quickly to throw out there, um, a bit of well, a bit of information. But although I was incredibly um, ignorant of this, um, Aragorn was a large kingdom um, in which um, occupies occupied about half of it was in France in modern-day France, I should say, and half of it was in modern-day Spain. And it was absolutely, you know, it was it was sizable. It was um, not on a global scale, but it was sizable in that it was about as big as England. It wasn't a small, like, little sliver of Spain and a small little sliver of France. It was a massive kingdom, although um, in order to get to England, anyone go, uh, going from the Kingdom of Aragon would need to travel through some of France. They'd only need to travel through a little bit of it to kind of get to the right shore, or they could sail all the way around Spain. But it's, 
I don't know, because like, I'd never heard of it, I didn't think it was a big deal, but then I saw it on a map and it was just like, okay, that's actually, yeah, that's... Uh, it's yeah, that's one of those big. things, it is, it, is, it is ignorance, but it's like, it's not, not intentional ignorance. You hear the name yeah. Catherine of Aragon and you're like, oh, that's just her name, you know. And then yeah, when eventually it. you see it on a map, you're like, wait a minute, that makes more sense than her just being her name. <laughs> like, and it also makes sense why him. King Henry wanted their, wanted them as a Protestant nation co- covering his back. Yeah. I yeah. mean, she, it's Catherine all- of Aragon, was heavily Catholic. Mm. She was devout Catholic. She actually retreated to a nunnery after being divorced. Not that. Oh, I do like that at least Catholicism does have sanctuaries, um, but that's a whole other conversation for another, for another time. Um, okay, so yeah, King Henry VIII, I guess, was our um, our first Renaissance king. Um, what I f- like, what do you think of the Medici family as a whole? Did you? Did you come across them much? Like, I realise they're, they're used a lot in pop culture and stuff as well. Yeah, but, uh... I've, I've heard the name quite a lot. What relevance they have, I couldn't tell you. Um... Oh, okay. Um, they're, uh, they're a very... Okay, so um, in ancient Rome, um, a number of families which ended up vying for the seat of emperor were originally... Um, olive oil uh like franchises um with the medicis uh they vied for several thrones um and the popiacy popiacy pope yep the seat of the pope yep i got what you mean and they succeeded several times um in several yeah in several different countries and getting the seat of on the top of the church um and they they did that because they uh, they were originally a banking family, that and again this is I guess one of my problems with not with organized religion, but when you when it becomes too organized, too institutionalized, and you can buy your way to the top, you know, like that's that's just one of those things. But but the Medici family were hugely influential. Um, and it was kind of almost a sign of the Renaissance was this um, mercantile or this ability to use trade and just wealth to achieve greatness. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, the, some of the best produce of the Mediterranean now is um, sold under the name Medici. Yeah, because it's got those um it's got those old uh ties with uh yeah, with kind of greatness or with kind of like skilled trading. Yeah, I knew I uh, I knew I could I knew I'd heard the name in the modern day and mm. both both modern and historical. I know I know the names come up in historical texts that I've been reading, but I also know that I've I've read it in like modern day or maybe it was on a cooking program or something like that where they floated about it being Medici or whatever um, I can't remember no, they, specific they, they probably would, it probably would be a, a thing um, okay so yeah as you said Martin Luther uh, was in your mind the uh, the most influential um, I believe he yeah he did put stuff he put stuff out there though which was already in people's minds um and yeah, like I think he did have a huge effect in that he kind of stood up and pointed out some of the obvious kind of flaws with the Catholic Church at the time. Yeah, I've got. A he quote. wasn't perfect himself, but yeah. he did. He did do well. I've got um, a quote from his ninety-five thesis, um, oh, exactly on that line. It says, "Why does not the Pope, whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus?" Build the Basilica of St. Pe- Peter with his own money, rather than with the money of, his, of poor believers. 
Yep. And it's a fair question, and that's why it caused yet another schism. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's not. Like, um, I don't think he asked the question aggressively in a way that was like, you should be doing X, Y, Z. I think he kind of just said, like, come on, man, you've got enough money. Why are you not doing this yourself? Like, you are a leader, therefore be the leader. Like, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself kind of stuff. Yeah, Is that not like, what you preach? Be, be the change you want to see in the yeah. universe using yeah, modern yeah. day terminology. Yeah. Um, for me, there was a... Okay, so I see... Hmm. One of the most influential people uh, was Nicholas Copernicus, um, who was a Polish astronomer. Yep. And what he did was he started, um, he got rid of something. Well, he didn't disprove it. Galileo disproved it. But all of the original, all of the concepts that were set about by, or that were proved by Galileo, were first uh, brought about by um, Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus, yeah. Yeah, Copernicus, sorry. Um, and it's interesting because you know how you said about how people did loads of different things? Yeah. Copernicus was both a lawyer and a doctor. And an astronomer, <laughs> and yeah. also a philosopher, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, to be fair, and it's just like if you oh, okay, all right, you, you you couldn't just stick with one impressive career. You had to, you know, get all of them. But um, what he came up with was really important to me, at least, in that he um, he started the journey from believing in uh, geocentralism, which was a fallacy brought about by, um, I think it was either Aristotle or Plato. Which was, was the Earth is the centre of the... Uh, centre of the universe, because yeah. why wouldn't it be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then it was also kind of the, the idea that um, beyond, the, beyond the moon, uh, the everything else in the sky was metaphysical and in, insubstantial rather than just very far away. Yeah. Um, and so he brought about um, heliocentralism, which was believing that the sun um, is, is the center of the universe, but that, that's wrong, but at least believing that it's the center of um, the solar system and that the earth travels around the sun. Um, it also interests for, me. Still waiting for a lot of humans to catch up with heliocentrism. They are yeah. not the center of the universe. The the sun <laughs> is the, the center of the solar system. That is definitely the sun, and you should get on with your own lives because you are, in the grand scheme of things, inconsequential. But you're only cons consequential to yourself. Yeah, that's it. But he was. Um, I, I see him as one of the the major things. What really does kind of. I guess what kind of frustrates me is the uh, about the Renaissance, some, or at least one of the things that um, frustrates me about the Renaissance is some of the unfairness. Um, not just the the fact that it's when um, colonialism really kind of started and took off, which I also found ridiculous because there were a number of books which were instructing people on how to do good business and a number of the books simply pointed out that um, if you follow the things in the bible like love your neighbor or if you try and do good to these people uh, to people who are poorer than you you won't gain financially from that so you shouldn't do it and it's interesting to me that you had writers writing that and advising kings and they weren't touched because of their high positions yep Yet the moment somebody didn't have that that clout or that high position or that influential family, that's when they were persecuted. And that's that that to me kind of really Yeah, that that annoys me, just the 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 fact that money bought you safety. Um 
it still kind of just frustrates me. Yeah, I suppose it's a um, good, okay. good point to segue into <clears throat> the uh, the teachings of the Renaissance and how that kind of changed. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. So the uh, the difference between the Renaissance and I suppose Middle Ages was that um, in the Middle Ages you kind of learnt your trade and you stuck at that. You became part of a guild, etc. Um, in the Renaissance, they had two kind of core um, teaching umbrellas, shall we say? They called them the Trivium and the Quadrivium. Yes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the Trivium was like their most important, and the Quadrivium, quadrivium was not necessarily liberal, less important, but not necessarily less important, but it was um, secondary, shall we say, to the Trivium. The Trivium is the teachings of grammar, the teachings of logic, and the teachings of rhetoric. Um, and to put that in layman terms, it's the art of using word, then the logic of thinking, and or the art of thinking, and then rhetoric is the art of communicating your thinking in words that make sense to other people. Um, or Trivium is arts number uh, the arts of number and quantity so that's the teaching of arithmetic geometry music astronomy um things like that no that's yeah that's a good point like i know that that was it interests me as well um that rhetoric was seen as so important like another thing you know what? I, I should have I, I should have researched more the people that I don't like, and kind of said why I don't why I don't see their um, contribution to the re Renaissance as a good thing. Um, the types of people that I didn't like in uh, the Renaissance were the people who said. Um, or the people who were so versed in rhetoric that they could make anything true by talking. Yeah, so um, basically the media, modern, the, the propaganda of today. Yeah, the, of the very first spin doctors. Yeah. And they would write these books um, to prove how good they were at rhetoric and send them off to kings, quite often multiple kings, as a way of saying, look, let me in your court. I can make any decision you make just and legitimate. Yeah, seem like the best you thing know? in the world, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. it's just like I realize you want everyone wants a place at court and stuff, but you're just you're enabling somebody who's already been way too enabled. Yeah. And I, I like when I heard about, you know, um when I heard about several of these people who wrote these books and sent them off to both the King of Spain and the King of England, and weirdly enough to Henry VIII, to say, look, we can make, you can do whatever you want and I'll take care of the details. Um, that just wasn't fantastic. I think also the idea that I don't like that came about in the Renaissance was the idea. It seems to be the birthplace of we have rediscovered um, Aristotle. We have found out what is profitable. Therefore, we are better than everyone else. It's when, like, Europe as a power started to come into its own thing. And immediately, almost immediately, the people in power started trying to figure out how to carve up the rest of the world. Yeah. And lay claim to things that weren't weren't theirs yeah you know i mean pre pre-renaissance people would not have called themselves re-european um, that's it however yeah. post-renaissance it was pretty normal to be european yeah. you know as a as a sect um mm. and anything that wasn't european was seen as lower base until the new world of course it was Columbus's was it Columbus that went to the New World? So Columbus Apparently. went to Columbus went to America. Um, there was another bloke 
who went and did it, uh, called John uh, Cabot, who weirdly enough did it under the patronage of King Henry the Seventh. An interesting thing about him, his name was actually Giovanni uh, Cabot, and he literally, um, really weirdly, the whole reason why he went on this voyage to try and met, go find another way to get to India and get the get the spices, get all of the dyes, get all of the good stuff, was because he was running away from debtors. And it almost <laughs> like says it all. He literally ran out of Florence in the city states and went to England and sought um, patronage there because he'd rung up loads of debts in his home country. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. But sorry, yeah. Columbus, Columbus um, is renowned for finding uh, America. My, my, I, I kind of actually I mean, he went prefer... knowing it was there. There are yeah, there yeah. are maps from yeah. like the Perry Reese map where it is quite clearly um, painted on this map. I, I also love that another thing that they don't teach you in history class is um, although you know we had some maps and there were some classical maps from ancient Greek and stuff. Um, it was the astrologers. Um, and it was both Jewish and Arabic navigators yeah. who who helped who helped in this um, in this European expansion. And I'm sorry, I'm not saying like oh, who helped as in like they they were they were no, responsible it was their for instruments. the evils that came on with them. Yeah, it was their know how. It was their instruments like, and their knowledge which why, enabled. Why are we taught that at school? Like, why is why are the well, where do you live? Yeah, no, all right, fair. Yeah, yeah. I, and just I to live clarify that point for I live in England. listeners, exactly, because we live, I mean, if you live in America, you're taught, a, you're taught the American perspective. You live in England, you're taught the English perspective or the U United Kingdom's perspective. And it's really important to remember that when you're learning things at school. Um, like do go out and do your own research because you will find that there is a little bit of taint on your education because you're taught a certain perspective you're taught a, ter a certain rhetoric um you must dip your toe into other waters in order to get a broader broader picture of your education which i think is a lot of what the renaissance was kind of saying like we can't just go by what our leaders are saying or what our church is saying we have to kind of broaden our horizons and and look at look at the look at the bigger picture and it was mm. i think the, the annoying thing is that um there are there are hypothetical um conversation conversations going on that the renaissance is um is a non-existent entity in history um and i understand the reasoning behind it in that it only really existed for those with money and power. Uh, yeah. You know, the, uh, like yeah. the Renaissance only, because let's face it, the only people who had the time to think about things beyond the end of the day and the money they were getting, the bread and meat that they were eating, was people that didn't have to worry about those things. And they're the minority. They're the elite. They knew where their meal was coming from because they had people that were going to get it for them. That enabled them to then broaden their horizons, proverbially speaking, and therefore the, the Renaissance exists. And history is written by those people that had the money and power to write the books um, and talk about this Renaissance. I, shouldn't, I should point out as well that the Renaissance wasn't this thing that... Um, Thing, the light comes on and all of a sudden you realize there's a renaissance like it happened over 200 years and nobody knew it was really happening it just kind of happened as a matter of fact the layman the worker had no bloody idea that it was happening at all it was only really the powers that be that knew this kind of movement was happening and that this transition was happening and eventually it filtered down absolutely 
like you know like the fact that um anti church uh pamphlets were being written the fact that um books were available to more um more rich people doesn't change the fact doesn't really affect you if you're illiterate if you're an illiterate fisherman yeah or a farmer or um to be fair it doesn't really affect you all that much if you're one of the many workers in um yeah in any of the kind of in the first factories in the city states where craftspeople would be gathered from throughout the country and at least given a station where they could work whereas before maybe they were destitute or had a successful successful business although they were drawn together it was other people it was the rich it was the elite who still benefited from their from their labors yeah um as we're we're coming um towards uh, the end of time just very quickly um i i've only just found out about uh my my favorite person from the renaissance um but just so that i've always given other people the the choice uh first who although we've talked about most influential as a person who is your favorite figure from the renaissance and um, what it is about them that you respect or like i think da vinci mm. da vinci because his art was is still today so um influential and the bloke was designing things like helicopters yeah and stuff way before he even knew anything about light so the guy was he, if an alien existed in humanity in the 14 1500s it was da vinci he was way before his time he was so clever so intelligent and an incredible artist and philosopher and mathematician and architect. God, just the thought of being good at all of those things hurts my brain. But yeah, he was all of the above. No, absolutely. Um, for me, uh, although it's somebody in the later Renaissance, uh, it was somebody called Bartholomew uh, de las Casas, um, who isn't massively... Um, famous because his contribution was a reaction um against uh some of the things that started had started to happen as a result of the renaissance um he was literally the first uh, so you know about like william wilberforce yeah yeah the the bloke the former slaver who then became an advocate for um abolition yeah. Weirdly enough, it turns out that this had actually happened several hundred years before, and it was this bloke who was the f like the first person who, in his young life, went out to Cuba and went out to the islands in the Americas and uh, annoyingly carved out a fortune for himself um, through, if I'm honest with you, bloodshed and exploitation. But then, who, hey, he was only doing about, what he was taught. Well, this is this is the thing. He did it. Then he became the first Catholic priest in the new in the New Americas, and he continued to um, he continued to gain um, from these evil things. And then he read, and then he when a bunch of other um, priests came over from Spain and started pointing out what you guys doing this is literally um this is literally genocide what what are you doing um he rebuffed them sent them back but then five years later he was reading reading the bible he came across a line in ecclesiastes um 34 verse 18 which basically pointed out that god doesn't look favorably on an offer to him 
which was taken by un by evil games or by if you're a dick and you profit by it and you try and give it to god god doesn't like that is the very layman translation of it and w it's really weird that this bloke who had been oppressing the people in the people in these islands it, it, he had, he loaned owned some land in Haiti and he had a complete turnaround and he immediately gave back his land to the natives and then started to convince trying to convince all of his other land owning friends that they should do the same it went down like a lead balloon um he stopped being quite as rich he slowly but surely um lost all of his political power um and he wasn't able to he did his very very best to convince people he wasn't able to and he ended up um yeah he ended up go um becoming a monk but it's just it's interesting to me that at the very least he's celebrated nowadays because he realized what he was doing was wrong and changed his mind i reckon he's had a conversation with a burning bush well, maybe, maybe he did. Maybe he did. Um, it says he was just reading the book, but I don't know what he saw or if he had any dreams or anything. I should have maybe researched it more. If he was in South America, South America, then he might have taken a bit of ayahuasca, and then he definitely would have had a conversation with a uh, burning bush. To be fair, hallucinogenics have been used throughout most societies in history. That's a whole different yeah. topic. Let's not get <laughs> yeah, into that, that right Okay, now. you know what? That's, right, that's, that, that is another one that we'll do at another point. Um, but yeah, he's... He's my favourite, and it's annoying though because he's my favourite simply because a lot of the other ones were well, they were all products of their time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's important to remember that they were taught a specific way of thinking, and they liked mm. to think they were quite revolutionary in the way they were thinking. But at the end of the day, they were subject of the times. And yeah, like Martin Luther was fantastic in that he was able to um, denounce the Pope's. Uh, use of finances but he himself was not pro-semitic and was not pro -Islam. no i mean he was he was a subject he didn't get a scholarship for um his uh, religious studies because his father was so bl bloody rich his father was a copper miner and um, owned copper mines and as as such when it came to him changing from law to religion studies he couldn't get um a scholarship because he's because he had too much money um so it, my god it wasn't like i said the renaissance existed only for the elite you know it was certainly wasn't a lowly fisherman that, right and, that, and this is why martin luther wasn't just stoned to death by a rabble absolutely because he was that because he, he was had, that rich he had money he had he had Standing in society, he wasn't just picking up peanut shells. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I think uh, m my very least favorite character of the Renaissance is Hernan Cortez, uh, but that's a whole other conversation for another time. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't have, yeah. I don't. I really don't know enough to have a least favourite. I think from an English mm. perspective, you've got, to, you've got to have a bit of a distaste when you talk about Henry VIII. But it doesn't come without it. Like, once again, he was a subject of his own um, Yeah, I mean, to be standing. fair, like, if a girl smiles at me too much, I'll start getting big-headed. Imagine, you know, being pampered to your entire life. Yeah. I mean, no. I didn't know that Greensleeves was actually written. Um, I say written. I use that term in very loose quotation marks by Henry VIII. Um, he wrote Greensleeves as a wooing for Anne Boleyn. Mm. I say he did. Obviously, he had a court, um, a court minstrel that wrote it for him and then made him go and perform it to Anne Boleyn to woo her. No, it is. You you do wonder how much of anything 
the people who wrote these things actually came up with. Um, but yeah, you know, like the fact that the Renaissance was, you could only have books on the quadrivium um, if you could afford books, and that was definitely not everyone. Yeah. I mean, I was watching a complete tangent here, but once again, that whole topic of you wonder how much um, somebody that wrote the book actually has to do with the the research. Like, I watched Oppenheimer, and he really learned that actually Oppenheimer was just the guy at the head of the operation. There were scientists that kind of had the thinking that made it go the way that it did. Um, and Oppenheimer was just the guy leading the road, leading the car, as it were, as it travelled down that road. Um, no, he was he was just the guy at the wheel with very I, limited I, control over where it was Don't get me going. wrong, the guy was very much, he had uh, a number of the, the, the pinnacle ideas that led to the, uh, the hydrogen bomb, but there were scientists below that made his vision a reality. I don't know that his education would have been enough on its own to mm. um, make the hydrogen bomb a reality. Yeah, that's fair, and that's a, that's a good point. Kids, if you're listening to this, um, first off, you probably would be better served by other people, but secondly, uh, don't, yeah, be careful of what you're part of. I, uh, I know I've been part of things that, in hindsight, I'm not necessarily too happy with. Um, but all right, anyway, um, yeah, so that was the Renaissance, guys. It was a massive uh, cultural movement um, over the 15th and 16th century um, from feudal individual countries in Europe to Europe as a mass identity, uh, the beginnings of colonialization, um, corporations beginning to have their power, the rise of the mercantile classes. Uh, innovations in art and visual uh, and visual representation, uh, and the death of um, a theocracy, uh, yeah, a theocratic state in the form of uh, the end of the Byzantine Empire. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, goodbye from myself, and goodbye from me. Hi. Right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.